Okay, so absolutely crazy news today that we've heard with the revelations regarding foreign interference, and we're going to break it down a little bit. So we've got some characters that are going to be mentioned in the upcoming clip showing from Kevin Vong, his testimony earlier today when speaking with reporters. And I just wanted to give a little brief preamble to some of these people. So Senator Pon Wu is a current sitting senator for British Columbia. He represents the independents. He's not affiliated with any party. You're also going to hear about Victor O. Oh. He's a previous senator. He's retired. He just retired in June 2024. You're also going to hear about Liberal MP Mary Nag, or Nag, I'm not really sure how you say her last name. So all of those faces you've seen up there, that might seem familiar to you. And let's just get right into it. Good morning. Canada's democracy has been under attack by authoritarian regimes. Chief among them is the People's Republic of China. And I'm joined today by leading experts on foreign interference, Sam Cooper, investigative journalist and author of Willful Blindness, Third Edition. Dr. Charles Burton, Senior Fellow at Synopsis, and Michel Junot Katsuya, former Asia Pacific Desk Chief at CSIS, the Canadian Security Intelligence Service. We're here today to address a question that all Canadians have been asking. Who are the parliamentarians who have been identified in a confidential report by the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians? In their special report, paragraph 164 states that NSICOP has quote, seen troubling intelligence that some parliamentarians are, in the words of the intelligence services, semi-witting or witting participants in the efforts of foreign states to interfere in our politics, end quote. How can Canada have an election if Canadians don't know whether the people they're voting for has their best interests at heart or if they're serving a foreign master? Nearly every opposition party leader has called for the names of the parliamentarians identified in the ENSICOP report, but the Trudeau government refuses to do so. This plays directly into the hands of authoritarians. Until those names are identified, a cloud of suspicion hangs over all parliamentarians, but especially those of Chinese heritage. It's time for the government to come, come clean to Canadians and defend our democracy. Sam. Thank you. MP Vaughan. I'm here today to highlight some of the names and entities covered in my updated book and to pose a question. Should other Canadian journalists be examining the openly available evidence surrounding these networks? Firstly, my book recounts reporting on a 2020 tape recording provided to me where Senator Yuen Pao Wu is heard in a 47-minute private briefing with the Canada Committee 100 Society. This group included Conservative Senator Victor O oh as an advisory member, along with an, individ an individual officially listed in a Chinese United Front Overseas Leaders Group. The Canada Committee 100 Society is led in Vancouver by Ding Guo, a journalist who is also an advisor to British Columbia Premier David Eby. Other journalists participating in this tape-recorded meeting with Senator Wu later supported Liberal candidate Parm Baines in 2021. Baines had told these journalists he opposed Kenny Chu's foreign agent registry bill, describing it as an exclusionary policy. Ding Guo was also reportedly involved in the 2022 Conservative Party leadership race, alongside community leaders officially connected to Beijing's overseas influence arm, the United Front, I can provide more details later on how this should illuminate NSI COP 2024. In the taped meeting, attendees asked Senator Wu about his stance regarding United Front Work Department community group activities in Canada. These groups, according to CSIS, are central to targeting Canadian politicians for influence and election interference. Senator Wu expressed his concerns about Canada's focus on United Front groups stating, whether you belong to an organization that happens to be listed as a United Front organization should not be a litmus test, and added, I am fighting very hard against that type of lit litmus test. To provide the evidence of this uh, tape-recorded meeting, which my colleague Charles Burton, uh, a sinologist and Mandarin language expert, uh, reviewed and analyzed for, for myself, I'll briefly play uh, a transcript from this meeting. I'm very worried that the mainstream of Canada, including a 
lot of my friends and political leaders and business leaders and media leaders are falling into a very dangerous trap where they are using what I call a litmus test to demonstrate the loyalty of Chinese Canadians uh, in this country. We can identify, uh, for example, your views on Hong Kong, your views on Tibet, your views on leaders, your views on South China Sea, whether you belong to an organization that is officially part of the uh, you know, many organizations are listed uh, as part of a United Front uh, list of organizations. And uh, the fact that you are simply associated with one is often used as a litmus test. But this is not a good development. Mr. Burton, the, the sinologist and Mandarin language expert, reviewed the full tape recording and told me, quote, Senator Wu's briefing to Canada Committee 100 Society effectively enables the legitimacy of agencies of the Chinese Communist Party in our country. This does call into question Senator Wu's intervener status in the inquiry. Senator Wu didn't comment to me about his remarks, but said I should question the Hogue Commission who also didn't comment. Ding Guo has said there is nothing inappropriate with Canada Committee 100 Society activities. Therefore, in Willful Blindness third edition update, I write, in a way, Senator Wu's intervention in the Hogue Commission seemed to fulfill his taped pledge to the United Front. He repeatedly filed submissions undermining Canadian intelligence and using Chinese intelligence talking points. My confidence that he appeared to act for Beijing was bolstered by information from a person I call Confidential Source One, who confirmed that Senator Wu, appointed by Justin Trudeau, was under CSIS investigation. Confidential Source Two also repeatedly stressed that Conservative Senator Victor O, an advisor to the Canada Committee 100 Society, was a significant target in CSIS's investigation into federal election interference. In Willful Blindness, I write about investigations that began in early 2019. I write, according to three national security sources, Liberal Cabinet Minister Mary Ng was identified in CSIS investigations as one of 11 Toronto area candidates clandestinely supported by Chinese consulate and United Front Influence Networks in the 2019 election. CSIS assessed that Mary Ng was unwittingly implicated in this interference network. Despite my requests, Mary Ng and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's office never responded for comment. As I write in Willful Blindness, Mary Ng was one of the key Ontario Liberal government staffers who moved to Ottawa with Trudeau alongside more pro high-profile advisor, advisors like Katie Telford and Gerald Butts. Two national security sources indicated that a specific CSIS concern was Ng's staff allegedly meeting privately with a Toronto consulate diplomat to consult on China-related issues. CSIS identified this diplomat, Zhou Wei, as a confirmed intelligence actor According to one source, quote, we believe Zhou Wei worked with political staffers to provide information on meetings of elected officials and their whereabouts. We know staff have direction to report privately to the consulate on Mary Ng, end quote. This is a critical detail hinted at in the Hogue Commission's initial report, which, for some reason, did not disclose the involvement of Mary Ng's staff with Zhou Wei or clarify what this implies about Ng's position in Trudeau's cabinet. Thank you. Sure. Okay, <clears throat> well, um, Sam Cooper's work these past many years has performed an important service for Canada in exposing the Chinese Communist Party's malign challenges to our democratic institutions and our rule of law. The issue now is the Government of Canada and the Parliament should do what to set things right? Justice Mary Jose Ogg's Foreign Interference Commission appears to be floundering as the government, fearing negative exposure, withholds the most critical documents and engages in self-interested obfuscation. 
Moreover, Bill C-70's effectiveness will be in the interpretation of the language, such as the definition of in association with that Senator Wu talks about, the regulations developed to implement that bill, and the inclinations of whoever the government appoints as Foreign Influence Transparency Commissioner. If we don't get it right, we could end up with a Foreign Influence Transparency Registry that will have no names on it. Sam's work has benefited from the willingness of confidential informants to share classified materials with him. These are the people that the Prime Minister has denounced as criminals. They are accused of endangering Canada's national security by potentially exposing informants and methods of intelligence collection. But is this so? Can we point to any negative effects on, Can on Canada of Sam's reporting? It seems to the contrary that Sam's work is rather a benefit to protecting us from China's agenda to undermine Canada's sovereignty and national security. If so, this calls upon our government to become more forthcoming with what classified investigations learn about China's malign activities. In this regard, we have a lot to learn from Australia, the UK, and the US. They shouldn't have to give it to Sam, although good thing that they do. A May 2023 CTV report entitled, Why Does Canada Have a Disproportionately High Pro Number of Chinese Diplomats? revealed that there are 176 Chinese nationals with diplomatic credentials in Canada. In contrast, the United Kingdom's active database of foreign representatives shows that there are 124 Chinese diplomats working on British soil, 50 fewer than there are here in Canada, despite the, US, the UK having a larger population of 67.3 million, with 4.7 million people identifying as ethnic Han Chinese in Britain. According to Canada's 2021 census, there are just over 1.7 million people of Chinese origin living in Canada. While Canadian demographics are like Australia, we have nearly three times as many Chinese foreign representatives here. Australia has granted diplomatic credentials to 64 Chinese officials compared to Canada's 176. The numbers of Chinese diplomats in Canada indeed look disproportionate considering that the United Kingdom has 44 accredited representatives in Canada while Japan has 73. So assuming that China certainly does not require this number of accredited diplomats in Canada to fulfill legitimate diplomatic functions here, the large numbers of diplomatic passport holders from China working here in Canada would likely show that a high proportion of China's diplomatic cohort here in Canada handles diplomatic influence operations that have tipped over into interference activities. Um, you know, uh, Michelle has suggested about 70% of them are not engaged in legitimate diplomatic functions. This is markedly apparent in the uncommonly large Chinese consular establishments in Toronto and Vancouver that Sam has written about at length. The U.S. Department of State Advisor for U.S.-China Bilateral Affairs, Ryan Fedesyuk, has calculated that the budget of the Chinese Communist Party's United Front Work Department exceeds that of the PRC Ministry of Foreign Affairs. This suggests because China has so much resources into the kinds of activities that Sam has been exposing, that as a matter of national priority, CSIS and the RCMP need considerable augmentation of their resources to match the scale of the resources hostile foreign nations allocate to their programming designed to subvert Canadian parliamentary democracy. You know, we need the same amount of people working against them as are working uh, to subvert our country. In addition, there needs to be a considerable <clears throat> restructuring of these counter-subversion measures, including much stronger integration of the relevant elements of, of Global Affairs Canada, CSA, CSE, and the RCMP at the working level. Finally, here in Canada, we can observe former cabinet ministers, former ambassadors to China, and people retired from senior roles in our foreign ministry who have assumed lucrative China-related opportunities 
after leaving government service. It would be very difficult for Bill C-70, the Foreign Influence Transparency and Accountability Act, to track the silent implication of future payoffs for officials who took the Chinese Ministry of State Security's bait years uh, earlier and therefore are not following up on s documents produced by security agents calling for uh, the government to do something about Chinese malign activities in Canada. So we need other mechanisms to deal with this issue of people after retirement who may have been neutral or possibly even wittingly served Chinese interests from gaining um, benefits from a foreign power. I, I would point out that officials who have security clearance in Canada are bound by a lifetime ban on their revealing or benefiting from the classified information that they gain knowledge of in the course of their work. I would suggest a commensurate measure would be lifetime restriction on persons who have had influence on Canada's foreign and security policy from assuming positions that include income or benefits from hostile nation foreign services after they leave government work. So I, I've recommended here four rather obvious and simple actions for the next government to consider after Justice Ogg releases her report on December 31st. But the history of the Canadian government's adopting the recommendations of commissions, whether they're royal commissions or just commissions, has not been good. But if our government blows this matter off with lip service and no substantive follow-up, I believe strongly that history will judge them very badly. Thank you.